So hi, everyone. Um, my name is James Nugent. Um, I work for Samsung Research. And unfortunately, my GIF game is not quite as good as Abby's, so I didn't have time to go and like, put new animated animals and stuff into my slides. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So this morning, we're going to be talking about systemd, which is an init system for Linux. And when I made this submission, I expected that this was going to be a two-track conference, and I'd be in the small room with like 15 people that cared about this. Um, so after Abby's rousing start, I'm going to put people back to sleep by talking about obscure bits of the operating system. So just so I have an idea of the audience here, can I get like a show of hands for people that run Linux systems on a day-to-day -day basis? Wow. That's cool. So this is probably easier to do it this way around. Does anybody use a Linux which does not have systemd? Cool. OK. Is it all Red Hat? Sorry. Right. So I think it's fair to say that systemd is one of the most controversial software projects around. And this is kind of reflected in the coverage throughout the tech media. So um, you know, this came from the Register, the UK um, IT news site the other day. Uh, this is one of the more restrained op-eds. Um, they range from sort of sanguine like this to sort of more hysterical, like is systemd the end of Linux? And clearly, from the show of hands, the answer is no. Um, some of the coverage is like pretty reasoned in um, evaluating systemd against its own stated design goals, uh, such as this post from the You Won't Fix blog. And you know, some people have just like uh, table flipped on systemd and forked all the distributions and taking it back out again. Uh, so it's also been a driver for people moving to operating systems which are not Linux. So um, you, know, you get a lot of people switching over to BSDs and that kind of thing, just to avoid this thing. So I'm not interested in relitigating the arguments for or against systemd at this point. Uh, it's far too early to be drinking. So instead, what I'd like to do in this talk is focus on you know, assuming you're committed to using a Linux distribution which uses systemd as its init system. What can it do for you, and how can you find more information about how to use it correctly? So the chances are you are. Sorry, the chances are you are using a distribution which has, well, clearly from the show of hands, that has systemd support. But you know the project started in 2010 by a couple of guys from Red Hat, and it spread throughout basically every mainstream Linux distribution. So we're now at the point where every long-term support major distribution has systemd in it. So that's you know, Red Hat, Ubuntu, and Debian-based, and uh, Suzy. That's another one I have no idea how to say. Maybe some Germans can tell me how you say Suzy later. Um, so each of these has the same init system now. That's like uncommon. You know, the, there were major differences between uh, the various distributions before that, and it was kind of impossible to write something that would work reliably and package reliably across lots of different distributions. So the genesis of this talk is the questions and comments I got after my talk at last year's Hashi Days, which made me realize that sort of a lot of people were interested in using systemd effectively. So in that talk, I went through bootstrapping the HashiCorp stacks so of console nomad vault uh, on AWS, uh, using some of the stuff that some of the patterns that we developed for doing uh, for bootstrapping HashiCorp's own SaaS. And all of the questions that I got were, huh, I didn't realize system. I, they weren't really questions, but it was, huh, I didn't realize systemd could do that. So the code for that talk is still available. Uh, I'll put a link up to it afterwards. And fortunately, other people have been maintaining it for me. So like, periodically, I get a pull request that's like, hey, this is broken. You should fix it. Um, so that's sort of where we're coming from. So let's go talk about like, different bits of systemd. So one of the most cited complaints about systemd is that it doesn't obey the Unix philosophy. You know, the principles put forth by the you know, lesser known Unix inventor, Doug McElroy, um, that programs should do one thing, do it well, be composable via text streams, all that kind of stuff. And that criticism is kind of fair. Systemd kind of encompasses a whole suite of software that's, and has a lot of moving parts. Right? It's more than just a single process in the init system. And there are three sort of primary aspects to it. The first is the system and service manager. And that's kind of what I'm going to focus on. Uh, that's the thing that runs as PID1. It replaces run levels. It controls the machine boot. Um, and it replaces all of the shell scripts traditionally um, that form that part of the system boot. The second thing it does is act as a platform for other people to build on top of. 
And the third thing it does is provide this thing called DBUS, which is um, it's kind of like glue between the kernel and user space that can be used for all kinds of uh, black magic. So the most important thing to understand is that systemd manages units, or it manages resources represented in the system as units, and it manages them in a dependency graph. So units can declare that they require or have an optional dependency on some other units in the system, and the startup sequence will take care of ensuring that you know, if, if I have a dependency on this thing, it will make sure that the thing that I have a dependency on is started before I try to start. So we could declare, for example, that like, the console agent requires the network to be up. And there's no point in trying to start the console agent until the network's up, because it's not going to do anything. So what we can do is kind of optimize boot into this um, directed graph, effectively. Now, in and of itself, that's not an innovation. So both LaunchD on macOS from like the mid-2000s and SMF on Solaris and Illumos also from the mid-2000s implement the same model. And closer to home, um, Canonical's upstart in its system does the same thing on Linux. That was used for a long time in Ubuntu. But one of the major differentiators is the units under management in systemd don't just have to be services. And not everything needs to be started at boot. So the way these things get configured is you write a text file that describes the unit that you want to um, create, and you stick it in a different place in the file system depending on who you are. So if you're building packages or you're an OS maintainer, you stick it in uh, lib systemd system. Uh, you can override these by putting unit files in Etsy system, D system. Or for non-persistent modifications for like a single thing, you can put it in the tempfs file system in run. Uh, it's important to understand the context of these things. So most files in Etsy are marked as comp files in the package managers for the OSs. So if you upgrade a package, things in Etsy won't generally get changed, and things in lib will get replaced. So if you make local modifications in the wrong place, they're liable to disappear. So the unit files are named with this kind of pattern, where they have a name and then a type. So we might have, for example, a unit called console.service to run the console agent. We might have another one called ssh.socket, which is a socket unit for accepting connections for an SSH server. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So the most common thing to find is service units. So let's look at the contents of one of the unit files that would run, say, a console agent. And oh, wow, that's kind of big, huh? Um, so the files are like this format that sort of evokes the Windows 3.1 style any system. Um, or TOML, although as far as I'm aware, it's actually neither of those formats and something completely custom, because why wouldn't it be? And they're just key value pairs which say, you know, which, which configure the various options for a particular service. So there's three important services, uh, three important sections, sorry. Uh, two which are in every type of unit and one that's specific to services. So looking at the two that are across, common across everything, there's a unit section which defines things like what's this thing called and what's its dependencies. So console isn't much used without a network, so we say that we're going to require the network to be online before we're going to start. And we want to insert ourselves in the dependency tree so that after the network started, that's when we'll, uh, that's when we'll try and start console. So the install section uh, which normally appears at the end of these files is the thing that actually places it into the dependency tree. And the way that's done is by hooking into another unit which is part of the boot process already. So um, traditionally, the way that was done was through run levels. Um, systemd replaces those. And so you can hook into multi-user.target, and that's basically the equivalent of saying this thing runs at run level three for people used to sort of older internet systems. So in the middle of the file is this section which is specific to the service. And we specify things like uh, which binary we're going to run. So you know, user local bin console with the parameters. And who are we going to run it as? And if we try and like, reload the config, say we change our TLS certificates or something, then what command are we going to send the running binary? In this case, um, you know, sig hub. And how do we stop it? And then finally, there's a restart policy that says, um, you know, let's assume this thing exits and it's not supposed to. What are we going to do? So in this case, we're going to just restart it. And that's like the universal answer to these. I'm surprised it isn't the default, actually. So there's a few different types of these services that you can run. Um, and they all behave in slightly different ways. So the simple, services, the simple service type is the default. 
And so you'd have to specify that. But that's for like normal binaries that behave themselves properly, and they just run and they stay attached to the terminal that runs them. Yeah, they just keep running until they stop. The second type, which is for programs which use the older style of demonizing themselves or daemonizing themselves, um, we'll get into more cuffles and addons in a second. So um, I don't know the pronunciation of those ones either. So forking things say, you know, this executable is going to is going to die as soon as it's started because it's going to double fork, sort of try and attach itself to the uh, to PID one. So systemd can keep track of those and keep them attached to the correct services and handle them correctly. There's another type of service which doesn't keep running but is useful to be in the dependency tree. So these are things where you just like want to run one command, and then once it's run successfully, everything else can carry on, but the thing doesn't actually stay resident and keep running. So they're called one-shot services, very useful for bootstrapping scripts and that kind of thing. And finally, there's this uh, type of service called a notify service. And quite often, especially if you're in like a distributed system or something, it's not enough to just be running the binary to have this thing ready. Like, if in the case of console, like the console binary can be running, but unless it's a member of a cluster, it's not that much use, and there's no point in trying to start anything else that's downstream of it. So there's a pattern that we can look at a bit later, which console supports natively, but you can also support in anything else where a system can tell the init system when it's ready for actual work as opposed to just when it's running its binary. So this is where we get into the bad pronunciation. Um, yeah, these system things are run using the command, I'm going to call it system cuddle. Um, <laughs> I've heard people use system control or system CTL or whatever. Um, I'm going to use system cuddle. So of these commands, these are the commonly used ones. There are a bunch of others as well. But enable, um, so units start off installed but not enabled, which means they won't start at boot. And that's kind of a, like for servers, that's not that useful. But for the desktop, it's very useful. Like you don't want all this stuff starting on, you know, every time you start your laptop. You, know, you reserve your kernel panic for when you plug in a monitor, not like you don't want it to happen at boot. So enable will mark that it should be started at boot. And then start, stop, and restart are fairly self-explanatory. They send the commands or run the commands that are specified in the unit file. And status, you'd think, would be obvious, but it's actually really useful. So if we go look at the output of status for, a, for that console um, module, we've got like a ton of information here. So some of the stuff we've got is the unit name and the description as it came out of the, um, uh, as it came out of the unit file. And we've got the location that the unit file was loaded from which is incredibly useful when like, it has one name, but it's actually something completely different. The other thing we have is the enabled state. So in this case, it's disabled because I never ran system CTL enable. So that means it won't run uh, a boot. So if we rebooted the box, we wouldn't have console running. We have the uptime of the thing. So you know, clearly, this screenshot was for this demo because it's been running for seven seconds in the actual production service. <laughs> um, the next thing we have is kind of huge for a Linux init system, and it's traditionally not been very possible. We have all of the processes that this service is responsible for. So the way it does that is systemd launches all of the processes respons uh, related to a particular service into a C group that's responsible, that only has that service processes in it. So in this case, it's created a C group called, uh, in the system slice, which is kind of a unit of accounting, and it's created a C group called console.service. And in this case, we only have one process because console behaves properly. But if we had something that did forking, or if we, had, if we were running like Apache, where it has a main worker and then a bunch of additional workers and then a bunch of like CGI scripts that are being exec, they'll all run in the context of the same C group. So it's finally possible to actually stop a service. Previously, you could stop like the main binary if you knew where it was, or you go chasing through some PID file. Uh, but it was never actually possible to terminate everything associated with the service in one easy command, and it now is. Finally, we get like the last 10 log lines. These are just standard out by default. You can kind of configure what gets logged. Uh, one of the more controversial parts of systemd is that it has a binary logging system called the journal. Um, it kind of works. I don't really get why people are that bothered about it, but it works. So we've looked at how units get configured by normally package maintainers. But quite often, what you want to do is just like override one or two settings. You don't want to go and rewrite the whole unit file because you want to run a bootstrapping script or because you want to like, change an option. 
So there's a system in System B called dropping configuration. And what that does is allow us to override the defaults supplied in the system by putting in a new unit file. And they live in you know, this kind of part of the tree here, you know, Etsy or lib, depending on where you're putting it, or run, uh, depending on the semantics you want. And then there's a per service configuration directory where you can put as many files as you like. It's commonplace to like, name them according to numbers. So you put like 10 config or whatever according to the priority. And they get loaded alphabetically. And that is alphabetically, so they're lexically sorted. So 10 and 100 are uh, like file names. Anyway. Um, there's a problem whenever you end up with this system where you can put overrides everywhere, which is what's actually the effective config running. So if you load a service that has a dropping config, the output of status changes. And you now see not only the, sort of the unit which caused the thing to exist, but you also see all of the dropping units. So you can look at any particular running service and know where did this thing get its config from and in what order, which is kind of useful. That works for the individual service. If you're interested in doing that for a whole box, there's a command that comes with systemd called systemd delta, and that will tell you the effective running config of every service on the machine and every config file which has been loaded. Kind of useful. There's a common bootstrapping pattern using um, drop-in units. So quite often you'll find like, some software that's either you've packaged yourself or is included in a base system repository. And these things have to work in a lot of different places. So people tend to make a very generic configuration. So for example, in our console package, we just get the binary and maybe like, some default configuration that turns on a couple of common options. But the environment-specific things, we want to be overridden by administrators. So what we can do is build an environment-specific package it just has a drop-in unit in it, and then install that, reload the systemd configuration, or reboot the box, and the environment-specific config will override the generic config that comes from the base package. So this can be used for separating out concerns when you're doing things like bootstrapping across different clouds. The bootstrapping scripts are often heavily dependent on a particular cloud's API, so you just build multiple packages. It's kind of important to install these things via packages and not by user data, sorry, because um, you can cryptographically verify that the config hasn't changed. So if you have, a well, at least apt can do this. I assume RPM can do this, but I don't actually know. Um, with apt, you can verify cryptographically that the contents of the machine is as it was installed. And that's kind of useful and actually required in some sort of highly regulated environments. So this is a working example of this pattern for console. Um, in that repository I was talking about. I'll stick the link up at the end. So we talked about service units, but there's lots of different types of units. So I'm going to cover a couple more of them. The first one is uh, target units. So targets are largely a replacement for run levels in older init systems. So traditionally, you'd boot through a number of different phases in a machine. It would run in single user mode or rescue mode, and then it would boot to multi-user, and then if you're on a desktop, it might boot to a graphical uh, run level. And these, I think these were like 1, 3, and 5, or something like that. I don't actually know the numbers. Systemd replaces these with named targets, and then it symlinks the old ones. So there is like a run level 3.target, which is a symlink to multi user.target. But an important difference is that we can define our own run levels. And this can be really useful for or orchestrating system startup. So let's imagine we have this script. This is not the correct way to do this anymore, but this used to be required. Imagine we have this bash script, because all problems are solved with bash, that uh, pings the local console agent to see whether it's part of a cluster or not. And if it is, the script will just exit. So we can use a one-shot service for this, um, and it can start after console. So after this thing is started, we're going to start pinging it until it's joined the cluster. And then what we want is for all of the downstream services which are dependent on console to not only wait for it to start, but also for it to be a functioning member of a cluster before we start downstream services. Now, the correct way to do this now is different, but this was the, this was the old way. So we can put this service, this one-shot service, into its own target by writing a new target file called you know, something like console online. And then all of the downstream services can use the requires phase for this service requires console to not only be started, but also for it to be online. 
And targets get reached when all of the services within them are started successfully. So that's how multi-user works, and you can define your own things in the same manner. Um, the correct way to do this now um, is to use this pull request that got merged into console. It was literally like a week after I did the original talk as well, so like, it's, this has been in production for a while now. So what console will do now is um, notify systemd when it's a member of a cluster. So um, according to the docs, I haven't actually tried it. I believe it works. But. Um, the way this actually works in practice is when the service gets started, systemd sets an environment variable on it which tells you where a domain socket is. And when your service has finished bootstrapping itself and is in a state ready to do like, actual work, you can write the string ready equals one. Um, and it's obviously case sensitive because everything in systemd is case sensitive because like, they hate everybody. Um, like, I actually spent ages looking for this problem where it, was like, it just had the wrong case on the string. Um, so console will do this now, and as soon as it's a member of a cluster, it will notify the init system. So you can get rid of that whole target and just make everything depend on console. That's now the correct way to do it. But the, it's still useful for things that don't support this yet. Uh, there's actually a library that's part of console if you're writing Go services um, that you can, yeah, it's like three or four lines, so you don't really need to put in a library, but if you like libraries, then there's one that's part of console that will do this for you. One of the use cases for this is um, services which need to prime caches and things like that. It's just not enough to know that the binary is running. You have to know it's ready for work. And you, know, you, can do, you can use health checks for that, but there's kind of no point in pinging something for a health check if it's not actually running. Like, if it can't possibly work yet, then why bother checking it? Just let it tell you when it's done. So another useful thing is socket activation. This is especially useful. Does anybody here write services in Go? Cool. Who likes trying to drop privileges in Go? Cool. Oh, you can't really because of the threading model. So this is kind of useful if you're after the principle of least privilege. So what socket units allow you to do is have systemd listen on a network interface on your behalf. And when there's traffic, it will start your service and pass a copy of the file descriptor that represents that client down to the service. So Leonard Pottering, the creator of Systemd, whose name I just butchered, posted about this on his blog. And there's some important bits in this uh, like pretty long quote. The first thing is, if a service dies, its listening socket doesn't die with it, so you don't lose client connections. This was a big deal for HA proxy for a long time. They finally fixed it via like, some ridiculous amount of code. But that's because they have to be cross-platform. But on Linux, you can just do this uh, socket unit, and then you don't have to care about it. The other useful thing is if a service is being upgraded, you don't have to disconnect all the clients because systemd is holding that connection. You just go recover the connections afterwards. So if you want to upgrade a long-running service, you can do that. This is really useful if you want to, say, bind to a privileged port. So you don't really want to run your service as root, but if you want to bind to a privileged port and you don't want to screw around with setting capabilities and things, then your only real option used to be to run the thing as root and then drop privileges. But the Go threading model doesn't allow for that. So, or at least it doesn't allow easily for that. So this is a good alternative. So how do you actually do this? So here's a program. This is, I believe this is the production system used for the UK Inland Revenues customer service line. And it's an HTTP server that returns 404 for every single request. <laughs> you can tell what I spent my day doing. Um, so we can modify this to use socket activation instead by replacing a couple of little things. So all we're doing here is starting a TCP socket on port 8081 and then serving HTTP over it. So to modify this to use socket activation instead, we can pull in the core OS system D library. And rather than, starting our, rather than creating our own listener, we can use this function that will go and get the listeners that system D has started for you. And then yeah, if you don't have one, that's a problem. And then you can just call HTTP serve in the same way as normal. The difference here is we can now have multiple sockets, because you can be listening in lots of different places for you on, for the same service. So if we went and built this new service, you know, we go build 404.go, and we can go test it using this um, systemd socket activate, which is effectively what gets used underneath. You don't actually have to deal with this on a regular basis. But if you want to test something outside of the init system, then you can use this to simulate that. 
So you can tell it to listen on port 8000 and then run your 404 binary when it gets traffic. So you get the output saying it's listening, and then you know, a separate terminal, you can curl this thing, and it will return 404 every time. But at this point, system D is listening, and all you're doing is accepting connections. So the actual listener doesn't need to die, and it doesn't need, you know, you can bind to port 80 here, run the socket as root, and then the, uh, the service as something that isn't root. So to make that actually work outside of the command line, uh, you need a service unit. So this is the simplest possible thing for a Go binary that behaves itself. And you need a socket unit. And what the socket unit does is just say, you know, which port are you going to listen on? Are you interested in IPv4 versus IPv6? Um, that's actually a default. You don't have to specify that, so it's not quite the simplest possible thing. But um, unfortunately, systemd hasn't quite succeeded in unifying all the pointless differences between Linuxes because people get the option of still setting these stupid defaults. So some have it turned on, some have it turned off, so it's better to always be explicit about these things if you're interested in running cross-platform. And then finally, we install it into the sockets target, which is, you know, this is something that runs after the network is up and available. And you'll notice that we didn't link the socket and the service together in any meaningful way. So they, that doesn't have a reference to the socket, and that doesn't have a reference to the service. Uh, they find each other by a common prefix. If you happen to name them different things, it is possible to link them via a different uh, directive in the file. So one thing that I didn't cover there is graceful shutdown. Right now, if you kill the service to restart it or something, you will you know, kill any active connections. Um, there's a great blog post, um, I'll put the link up at the end, that covers how you actually do graceful shutdown and zero downtime upgrades using this library and this pattern. Worth a read if you're doing Go services. So the last one that I want to cover, there are a bunch of different unit types that I'm just not going to talk about. But the last one that's interesting is a replacement for cron, which is called timer units. Timer units, uh, does anybody like the cron syntax? <laughs> one person, wow, OK. Um, basically, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, you can write a service file at the top, you know, this thing just dumps the date onto the terminal, I think. Is that what it does? Yeah. And there's a timer unit file underneath. Again, it's linked by the service name to the timer name. You can specify them if you need to call them different things, though. And this timer thing has lots of different options in the, the unit configuration. So one of them is on calendar, and this says it's going to run every 10 minutes. Um, there's also things like, say, run this two minutes after startup of the box, or something like that, or run this on every hour provided, like, the day ends in, well, they all end in Y. Never mind. Bad analogy. In general, the documentation for these is pretty good. Once you know the things exist, it's kind of easy to find out what the various options are. But actually understanding the scope of the entire system is quite hard. And this talk kind of only really scratches the surface of the capabilities of the system as a whole. We haven't talked about the logging subsystem, except to say we didn't care about it. We haven't talked about any of the desktop-oriented features. So you have the ability to start services when particular devices are connected. Um, so that's how you get Linux to come up when you plug a projector in, in more efficient manners. And we haven't talked about how to manage temporary files using temp files uh, units. We haven't talked about how to do network awareness. So you know, run these services when you're connected to this type of network. Very useful for connecting to public Wi-Fi, that kind of thing if you're on a desktop. And we also haven't talked about LoginD, which is the uh, you know, user session manager. The other things I haven't talked about um, are resource accounting. So because we're running everything in C groups, you effectively get all of the resource controls available in Linux available to you via systemd. And there's a program called nspawn, which will effectively allow you to launch binaries which are not, pa uh, not packaged into any kind of container format that will run with all of the isolation of, say, a Docker container. Um, again, there's a bunch of libraries from mostly CoreOS that, um, that allow you to natively integrate your, your own stuff with all of that. In particular, if you're in Go, there's you know, lots, of other lots of other people's uh, libraries for other platforms, too. So if you're interested in more information about that, then there's uh, a link at the end to the documentation that will tell you about all those different types of units that we really haven't had time to talk about. So with that, um, I will not keep people from coffee any longer. So thanks for listening. And there's a list of all these references here. <laughs>